One second. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, apologize for, uh, I need to apologize for my voice. Uh, I, I've been to Bangkok and I got a, uh, like a sore throat, some kind of infection. It's over now, but you may not hear me well, so just shout out. Oh, there's a mic? Okay. So that might be easier. So, um, in this talk, I want to tell you a story which we encourage, uh, we, which we kind of engage with one of our customers. And this story is basically uh, describing what we've, uh, what we've done and how, how and why we've done it. So, um, the title says it's a good quality code with Drupal 7, but you could actually apply it to any uh, framework or any software or any CMS or any platform you want. Um, it's mainly about writing good, good code, uh, with some examples using uh, Symfony components as well in Drupal 7. Uh, you kn I know that Drupal 8 came out a couple of months ago and everybody is already, bu already buzzing to use Drupal 8. But in the real life, we have still many projects which we have to maintain in Drupal 7. So that might, that, these ideas I, I'm going to present here may give you some tips how to start doing things in the right way, but still with Drupal 7 and then migrate easily to, to, to Drupal 8. Few words about me. I work for Sensual Labs UK. Sensual Labs is a company behind the Symfony framework. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Supermarek. Uh, I work for the company, which is actually a group of companies. Um, it's important uh, because um, Invica Group, as a group, has three companies inside. Session, which is a Magento company, uh, delivering Magento products, uh, solutions, uh, then Sensual Apps, which looks after Symfony, and ICOS, which uh, is a Drupal uh, CMS uh, li a little agency. So we, we work as a like, kind of like a shared, uh, uh, shared uh, resources uh, team. So um, the fact I'm working for Sensual Labs doesn't mean I, I won't be involved in the Drupal project or Magento project. So we had a customer who came to us and said, we have a mission. Mission for you, mission for us was that uh, it was a, a Magento platform they kept using for, for years, but they were kind of strapped with cash. So they didn't want to upgrade. They didn't want to um, patch it much. Uh, they, they just wanted to leave it as it is. That was an old version of Magento. Um, and they were using it as a CMS. It was a business to business customer. So uh, they didn't pay too much attention to how the front, uh, the, uh, the content for customers looked like, but at some point they realized that actually how it, you know, the, the, the way they present the data, uh, information to the customers, even though they're business customers, it's, still, it's actually important. So um, they came up to us with a, uh, with a challenge. They wanted to have a proper CMS but they didn't want to spend too much money. So, typical scenario. They want all the features, but they have no money, right? <laughs> so, if you know Magento, uh, Magento is a great e-commerce platform, but it's not a good CMS platform. And, uh, and what they wanted, they wanted to manage the corporate website, but they also wanted to manage uh, to be able to build macro sites, not necessarily related, uh, not necessarily tightly coupled to, uh, to, 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 the, to, to what they're doing right now. So they kind of like the broad of users they wanted was uh, quite, quite, quite big. So we decided, we suggested that the best solution for them would be Drupal. At the time, that was a Drupal 7. Drupal 8 was not out yet and our in-house Drupal team said uh, Drupal 8 beta was not ready yet. But why, why we decided to go for Drupal? 
it's open source CMS. It's, it's there. It's done. All the features they wanted, most of them, they were already out of the box. So the only cost they were actually paying was to configure the platform for them and uh, just give it to them so they can work with, with it by themselves. They were happy to, to look after teaming that uh, by themselves, building microsites by themselves. They just wanted to have a platform which would deliver all those features. At the same time, they wanted to have some kind of connections with uh, Magento. So, and they operated on a very limited budget. The project uh, eventually went live, but um, thanks to the customer, it got delayed by almost a year. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th that's always comes to when you have a limited budget and when you when you say, yeah, yeah. I, I right now I I need to stop and let's wait a couple of months till we get a budget to carry on. But anyway, project went live. So whatever I'm going to talk about in here is live and it's working. So we decided to uh, to to build kind of like a, a connection between Magento and Drupal. And this connection um, was being managed uh, by Composer. Do you know what's Composer? Uh, it's a, like an awesome tool to manage dependencies. Drupal 7 doesn't use it, uh, but you can use it with Drupal 7. Um, we use Symfony Components. Um, Symfony Components to, to build like a, a mini tasks um, which uh, I'll explain a bit later. So the, uh, yeah, so next step. So bef before I explain you what we've done, uh, let me talk a bit about clean code. So um, this is the thing which we love to do at my company. The, the, uh, we, we pride ourselves uh, in being software engineers where we write beautiful code we, be, we can be proud of. So, what, what do we, uh, w at, what, at what point we can decide that code is beautiful and that we, we're proud of this code? So, Eric Evans, a guy who's, after, uh, who's uh, created, uh, uh, wrote a brilliant book about uh, domain-driven design, said something like that, in order to create a good software, you have to know what the software is all about. So basically, in order to write a good software, you have to learn uh, what the business you're talking to is all about. If you want to build a software which represents what business is doing, it's great if you can translate that directly to your code. So how do we learn about those processes? So first of all, you have to... Uh, when you talk about projects, you have to find uh, stakeholders, owners of the project who knows who know how, what exactly needs to be delivered. There's the bigger project, the bigger company you deal with, the more people they have. So it's, uh, it becomes difficult to, ping, to, to ping, pinpoint those people you, you want to, to talk to. Most of the time you get project manager who doesn't care and just works as a proxy between business and, and, and uh, developers without paying att attention. That's the problem. Uh, sometimes you have stakeholders who don't care, who just say, this needs to be done on this date, and I don't care. So these are difficulties you, 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 may, you may face. The best way to, g to get st stakeholders involved is just to bring them to all discussions the developers have. It doesn't have to be all st stakeholders. Just find the person who's the most interested in the project and involve them as much as you can. So when you talk to the stakeholder, ask them to uh, describe using examples how the system should behave. Ask them to describe uh, using simple stories how they want the system to work. And the examples should be, uh, yeah, I'll get to examples, and ask them to, to describe the behavior of how the system should, 
should behave. And using, engaging, by, by engaging the stakeholder in doing so, they will start using language you want to, 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 to use as well. You start building a vocabulary of the same words. So when you talk about product, you know what product means. It's not a product item or it's not a catalog item. It's not a, um, it's the, it's not the inventory item for, for the stakeholder is a product. Uh, I've been in a couple of projects where we, uh, in one of my projects where we did a big mess up with uh, namings, was um, selling courses, right? So the customers had on the website list of courses and each course had events, uh, which you can book into, right? So let's say there was a course, uh, Symphony Training, which had a couple of dates, those dates were events. In a, in a code base, we call them course types and courses. That led to many confusions, because when we talk to the customer and then we look at the code, or even thinking about that, we were thinking about two different, two different things. Once you have a, your common language, ubiquitous language, um, it's a, it's a good language, uh, um, ubiquitous language is like a common language you have between all the parties. And it's good to keep that language, the same language, between all the parts involved in building your application. So if you talk to uh, developer tester, analysis to developer, or domain expert, or stakeholder to, to developer, all parties should use exactly the same language. And the same language should land in your code, acceptance criteria, specs, and documentation. So avoid the, like a translation cost as much as possible. And if you, if you talk to a stakeholder and you ask them for examples, ask them to give examples in a form like that, in a form of a future feature with a scenario written uh, ideally by the domain expert or by, uh, written by the uh, business analyst with the domain expert or stakeholder. And this scenario is uh, quite simple. As you see, this is, uh, have, you, have you ever used Bihat? So, okay. So some of those scenarios people use to uh, describe how the browser should uh, be clickable, right? So whenever you write those examples, don't try to uh, write scenarios uh, when I click that button and enter this field and uh, fill that field and enter this button and I go to another page. That's not a behavior. Behavior is like, given I'm visit visiting a product page for the first time and I got prompted to locate my nearest depot, when I er enter my postcode, then I should see uh, my local depot information. It's as little concrete inform as as little information about the browser behavior as possible. Sometimes uh, you cannot avoid that in some st in some stories. So when you have this store, this uh, little example, you can uh, you can extract uh, keywords. You have a actor of your story. So in order to correct, to see correct prices as a visitor, I need to be able to locate the nearest depot. So visitor is your, your actor. Then you have some actions. Those actions you can translate directly to your code. So in, in, my, in our example, uh, basically customers were business to business customers. They were based all around UK. Uh, whenever they were logging or coming to the website, they wanted to see the local warehouse prices. And unfortunately, the prices were not the same across the UK, so they had to enter the location. They were only, be, they, they were only uh, allowed to use one warehouse, which they belonged to, so they could see the prices. And that was the simple story which we, uh, which we had to implement. And that translated into a code base into a code. So we build an interface, Depot Locator, which is a, um, uh, which just basically describes a system um, in, uh, service, 
uh, which takes, which has just one method, locate dep depot by postcode, and returns uh, depot information. So, having interface is a is a, is a good idea because you can, uh, for testing, you can implement a test uh, uh, adapter for uh, for your code ba final code base. You can implement final solution. Oh yeah, this is an example how we then implemented uh, uh, Magento Depot Locator. So the, this was basically calling Magento service uh, to uh, to map the postcode back to Depot in our system. Is behind the scenes he was calling the Magento API, retrieving JSON, and just retrieving. But from because this was hidden by the uh, uh, interface, that was easy to stab in a, in, a, in a test. Why interface describes communication. Interfaces. Uh, the more interfaces you use, the better. The slimmer interfaces are, the better. They describe how your objects communicate with each other. Um, Robert C. Martin, Uncle Bob, said that high-level modules should not depend on a lower-level implementation. What that means is um, when you think about your application, your application has different levels of uh, engagement, let's say. You have user interface, which is being interacted by user. Then you have your application, you have your domain, and then you have your infrastructure. So whatever your domain does, your domain should not, uh, not know about the user interface. So you shouldn't have in your domain, uh, you shouldn't use language which is about clicking, uh, uh, filling fi fields or something like that. It's, it should be user interface agnostic or even framework agnostic. So in our example, when we had interface, so our domain said that I want to communicate with depot location via this interface. So uh, then infrastructure is the layer which implements that interface and is basically used by, by your domain or application. So it's basically something like that. You've got policy layer which uses some policy service. Then it's Im implemented by mechanism layer which may use some mechanism service which is provided by utility layer. So this is your interface which can be implemented by many other, many different uh, uh, objects. You can replace them for, for testing, for stabbing. So if you look at this, the, the higher level you are, you should only talk to the lower level of uh, abstraction. So if you look at the Drupal in Magento in here, from our perspective, from this exercise ex perspective, Drupal was the user interface. Magento was the infrastructure. Our code, what we've written was the application and domain. Drupal was just displaying what, what was coming from, uh, uh, from Magento. Okay. Clean architecture. So it's basically similar view, but just different, uh, di different take on it. What I said, so you have entity, use cases, controllers, and web. I'll just skip it quickly. Um, another take on it is a hexa hexagonal architecture, uh, which is basically um, the same what I showed you before with a layer architecture, but slightly different uh, view. Your application domain is in the center, and everything what doesn't belong to your application domain should be hidden behind the uh, port or adapt uh, behind the port or interface. So, yeah, in our example is uh, uh, Depo Acme Depot uh, Locator interface is our port. Uh, Magento Depot Locator is our adapter.
Okay, one why clean architecture. Uh, you end up writing less code. It's, uh, and the code is less complex. If you, st if you start doing those exercises, uh, it may sound like you, you, you keep writing more classes. You keep r uh, creating more objects. And it may sound like it's not really uh, less complex. It is, because your classes, uh, objects, are going to be simpler, smaller, uh, usually like two or three lines maximum. Uh, replacing one long 60-line uh, method. And if you have to debug it, it's much easier to unit test your uh, three-line uh, object than to mm -hmm. debug your 60-line uh, spaghetti code. Uh, they can be decoupled. We had, a, uh, after, after this exercise, we had a Magento guys uh, trying to use uh, modern tools, PHP spec, to uh, to write uh, a module for, uh, for 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 Magento, so what they did they, they created a they created a make mage spec extension to to PHP spec, so they can use all the goodies from Magento inside PHP spec. They created a module, and they realized oh, actually we don't need all those add-ons from Magento because our module is already decoupled. So they removed that and just made it work with a clean uh, PHP spec. And then they realized that um, actually this is uh, not related to Magento. It works with my Magento project, but it could be released as an open source project and other people could use it. So if you, if you use decoupled code, you can reuse it with other frameworks as well. Whenever you need a framework, hide it behind the uh, interface. So it, it doesn't work if you're just adding pages in Drupal because you're just using the uh, built-in functionality. But if you have to write custom code, then it makes sense to do it this way. And you know, Zen Framework 3 is just around the corner. Maybe it's going to be better than Symfony. And next year, everybody will be moving to, Symfo to Zen Framework 3. It might happen. Um, yeah, reusable components, uh, easy to test. Who's writing tests? Right. Yeah, yeah. The good, good uh, pro tip: uh, write your uh, write tests before you write code. Uh, it seems impossible at first. Uh, once you start doing that and you get used to it, you won't be able to go back. Easy to maintain, um, easy to change. The biggest problem with legacy applications is that we're afraid to change them, right? So if you have a nice, clean code, it's, it's a lot easier to change. Good books to read. So we have a clean code and a clean coder by uh, Uncle Bob, Robert C. Martin. These are highly recommended. Domain driven design. Um, after you go through those two, then it might be a bit boring, the domain driven design at times, but it's a really, really good uh, knowledge. OK, so the impossible, how we did it. Uh, first, we started with uh, dependency injection. So short story, long, short, long story short, short, we basically created our own micro framework using Symfony components, which sit between uh, Magento and Drupal. And this is how you do it most of the time. Uh, there are people like uh, Tyler Otwell who create uh, micro frameworks and then cr give them fancy names and then try to sell them. But you know you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to follow someone's solutions. You can all you can do it by yourself every time. Symfony is so flexible that you can just cherry pick which component you want, and you can do it. With Zen Framework 3, you've got exactly the same. They have now fully decoupled components. If you want to use Zinf Symfony uh, dependency injection with a router from Zen Framework. There is nothing which stops you for, for, from, uh, for, from doing that now. So uh, dependency injection, standardized way of loading dependencies, uh, pretty cool feature. 
So we created our kernel, uh, which uh, this container builder is a standard class from uh, dependence injection container uh, component in Symfony. Uh, why we started like that? We wanted this to be run without Drupal. Uh, why? I get to that in a, in a second. Um, container loads conf configuration from YAML or XML file. It's very handy. Uh, services loaded from XML. We used XML because some of our colleagues insist of using PHP Storm. Some people find it useful, and PHP Storm can uh, autocomplete your services names, service names from XML files, so it's useful. Uh, you can register ex extensions, um, application ex extensions, to modify uh, parameters from the uh, from the configuration. Um, we ex extracted it into uh, a method, private method. So we have a boot method which just builds container, and a build container just returns that. Uh, yeah, then we added caching, so we only need to build the whole container and all dependency injection once uh, when we install application. Uh, we don't need to rebuild it every time we want to use it, right? Uh, although, if we in dev, we actually want to rebuild it, so. Uh, so our parameters.yaml had all the configuration for uh, for database, SOAP client, which had to talk to uh, Magento, uh, some, some configuration for the product card rater we created. Uh, ex services XML, I would prefer YAML, but some people insist on XML. Uh, yeah, some let's build first console command. Uh, our first command was uh, built to import products from Magento, and then save them to uh, to the uh, to a source. So why? Uh, short story. Why? The problem with Magento was that it was very slow. That's not uh, that's standard for Magento, right? So we didn't want to hit Magento every time someone was searching for products on a Drupal site. So we wanted to keep a cache of uh, information. So this was a command line tool which would import uh, products from Magento and just dump, their, dump them somewhere. So this is, uh, yeah, it, it takes interfaces. If you, if you wondered what were product imported and product persister, uh, these are just interfaces. Uh, so in test, we can replace them with something uh, which is useful for tests mock them or whatever. So, uh, yeah, simple command. Uh, that's the import and persist command. Uh, that's a symphony, co uh, symphony command, which you, you, can command, you can run from the command line. Uh, so you have to register it. And the import and persist handler is injected as a service in here. And it's simple execution, displays simple execution time. Um, yeah, and our console file, uh, very simple. We have an autoloader for, from, from vendors, from con uh, Composer. Use our kernel we just built. Use console application from Symfony. Boot our kernel, register application, register commands, and run. And this is 10 minutes, and Symfony uh, sorted out as a uh, couple of uh, Commands. All the infrastructure for macro, micro, uh, like microservice app, is uh, was done. Okay, so persisting projects, products. So in the first attempt, we decided to use um, XML feed importer. It's a module in 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 uh, Drupal. The purpose of this module is it can take a feed, import it, and leave it. Right. The problem was it didn't work. But so in our case, we decided to, in our product persister, uh, we just dump XML product information to, to the file. 
and uh, uh, feed importer in Drupal should take it on and should import all product information. Thing was, it had to be run every day at around 5 a.m. because the data would, the, the master record for products was still in Magento. Uh, but uh, Drupal site had to be updated every day and customer decided that one day delay in getting updates is, is enough, is, is, is okay. So, yeah, fetching that data from Magento uh, was quick. Uh, then we can import it to, uh, to, to Drupal. Why did it work? Feed imported was very slow. And it was very slow. 10,000 products imported in four and a half hours. Whatever way we wanted to configure it, it was just not working. Scheduling import uh, with Elysia Cron uh, worked and then didn't work and then worked like started like going three times in a row uh, and it was resources hungry. It was uh, it basically didn't work for us. So uh, we decided to save directly to the database and uh, yeah so we just needed to create a new uh, database product persister instead of XML now we write to the database uh, we just yeah repository is uh, is interfacing here and just saves products so uh, why direct database write Drupal says that the product the data structure it will be always the same we didn't want to keep history of the changes in products. We just, the, the only thing which mattered was the product information was up to date. So it was fine. Then it was fast. 40,000 40, products imported within less than two minutes. And we didn't, we didn't have doubles. Uh, we didn't have problems with Elysia Cron. Uh, we didn't have uh, problems with, uh, no more problems with feed importer and no more problems with, um, um, no more problems with uh, resources. So we were happy. Yeah, so our composer JSON file at the end of the exercise, very simple. We installed Drush uh, using composer. Uh, you can install it globally, but uh, we have a preference to have a, a project version uh, tools rather than global tools. Um, Symphony console, config file system, doctrine double. We, don't, we didn't go for the full doctrine uh, bridge. And just database abstraction layer was enough to, to, to perform saves. Yep. So now we wanted to uh, make our service, one of the services to be available in Drupal but the service was written in as a symphony compo oh, oh, sorry as a decoupled component used with symphony application so we created a co co called container.php which would load um, the composer autoloader instantiate our kernel boot it and set it as a variable the container right it's a nasty hack but if you if you deal with um, nasty applications this is the way to do it. So thanks to that, we could have the same database configuration across both applications. Because in our database.php, we just take the uh, database configuration from our DI container. Perfect for our, our deployment. Yeah, remember that container had to be included before database. Uh, then we wrote our uh, depot locator module, which is very simple, takes postcode, uh, then takes container, takes our service, depot locator, dumps postcode edit, gets the depot to array, sets a cookie, returns. So this depot locator thing is here. It's a decoupled service, which we just inject here, use, and forget about that. And our depot locator knows nothing about Drupal. 
and you could use it in, with any any framework you wanted. Yeah, project folder structure. This is the thing people usually ask: how we uh, how we manage that. Drupal has its own uh, uh, folder structure. So, um, so Drupal was in a folder called public, as it's always, and it messes with the files and stuff. So our spec files, which we use, we use PHP spec to write unit tests, was in the spec folder. Uh, features, uh, Behat features are in the features folder. Source is when the source is. Vendor is where the Symfony components went. App, application, bin, some random stuff. Composer, build. Pretty simple. OK. Let's recap. Drupal. Whenever I speak about Drupal, people say, oh, you're Symfony guy, you don't like Drupal. I love Drupal. Drupal is great. And uh, don't let people tell you that Drupal isn't great. Every project, you know, it's like Drupal is not the greatest project. It's uh, the, code the code, especially in Drupal 7, is not the greatest. But if you don't need to write any code for it, or if you, if you just want to use it, it's great. It works. It does the job. If I wanted to build my blog right now, would I, would I go to, you know, back to the keyboard and write my blog from the scratch? No, I would use like WordPress or something like that. Use the tools which are available for you. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Unless you're really good and you really want to in impress people and you want to build a new awesome platform and you have an idea for it, then yes, go for it. Symfony components, cherry pick what you want. Just use what you want. Symfony full Symfony uh, framework is huge, it's pre-configured for you. If you build a huge application from the scratch, it's awesome. But if you want something small, something tiny, better, just pick a couple of components you need, configure it, uh, and that's it. Decoupled code, highly recommended. Unit tests at the unit code level, highly recommended. Write tools, that's all. Any questions? So when you were, um, you said you um, you decided not to use the Drupal feed module because it's too slow for your purpose. Yeah. And you um, you create some uh, Symfony code to um, to write these nodes into Drupal directly. Uh, were you able to call the Drupal functions within your Symfony code, or were you writing directly to the database tables? Uh, so we were writing directly to the database. Then I have a bit of an issue with that type of um, architecture because um, Drupal has a function that would save, uh, you, you would populate an object and then you save it, and then Drupal would then do the inserts into the table. And oftentimes, unless you know intimately which tables get updated with a, um, uh, you know, when you're creating a new product on Drupal, how are you certain then that you're getting all the right tables through your Custom in, uh, through your custom inserts? Well, first of all, we have an in-house Drupal uh, knowledge, and so we consulted that with them, and that was their recommendation. Um, we, did, we didn't want to use Drupal uh, functions because that would require to spin up the Drupal uh, st uh, uh, stack, right. and that would slow down the import massively. So uh, that's why we went for 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 for, for that this way. Right. We had a we had a clear way to identify which products uh, we had a we basically create a field to identify them and knowing the uh, the content structure, uh, the database structure for for for, inform for product information, we were able to update the product information basically in right. seconds. I know it's a nasty hack, but uh, uh, given the requirements, we, uh, that, that was the way we, ha we had to do it. Um, just on a side note, I'm actually I, I'm using speeds extensively now. Mm -hmm. I'm able to process a thousand XML files in about three or four minutes, I think. 
Okay. On a local, yeah. So you might want to revisit that if you ever get a chance. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so it could be other. So we found that um, it's not necessarily the import process that's slowing it down, but um, uh, in in our particular case, it was connected to a. Uh, it was connected. Uh, there was a third party module that was delaying this, the node save that was slowing the process down. So once you disable that module, then it's super fast. Right. So, so yeah, so sometimes these kind of things uh, may look slow, but yeah, no. And yeah, pro probably in our case was something similar. Yeah. The, the problem was that uh, the customer had a limited budget. Right. So we, we basically, to deliver this, we had uh, free sprints, right. so six weeks including building the whole... Yeah, uh, I understand how it goes sometimes with customers. Yeah. Thanks. More questions?